one and all uh, today we will be having a, an interesting uh, lecture on atherosclerosis which will be uh, done by uh, professor sanjay rajagopalan professor sanjay rajagopalan is a uh, chair of cardiovascular medicine in case western reserve school of medicine cleveland ohio he is a graduate of stanley medical college way back in uh, 1990s following which he went ahead and uh, did his higher studies education in uh, united states of america he, he was a fellow of cardiology from the famous emory university and he did uh, he did his uh, research in uh, uh, multiple uh, g- uh, high high impact uh, universities in united states its h uh, index is 96 with uh, 41000 citation which is uh, clearly unimaginable for most of us i grand welcome to uh, dr sanjay rajagopalan sir uh, we i would request dr uh, professor manohar sir who is the professor of cardiology at sri ramachandra university to moderate the session along with professor and head of the department professor t r murlidharan sir who will be joining us soon uh, in couple of minutes professor manohar sir uh, thanks for the kind introduction bhupati it's a privilege uh, to have you here amongst uh, us uh, through zoom at least and uh, deliver this talk sir without uh, wasting much of a time i would uh, like you to take over the uh, proceedings and take it forward sir okay thank you very much dr manogar and uh, dr bhupati and dr murli dharan thank you for the opportunity um i hope uh, it's particularly gratifying to see you know trainees and if 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 i can convey one message through my lecture it is really to focus on um uh, aspects that might be far more important for our patients which is really to prevent an event even before it occurs and hopefully through the course of my lecture you'll you'll try to appreciate the important work that has gone on over the last several decades it really starts to unravel uh, the importance of uh, preventive approaches diagnostic approaches that might tell you which of your patients is at risk and my humble exhortation to all of you particularly the trainees is really look beyond uh, you know uh, patients as uh, opportunities for stenting but rather look at them as opportunities for prevention and if you can do that uh, you know uh, i think my job uh, perhaps would be somewhat uh, somewhat accomplished so let me uh, let me start off by um, by acknowledging a few people um, and i think i happen to work in a, a very nice environment which i'll uh, share with you uh, i'm particularly privileged to work with Uh, some of our fellows and obviously our staff. We have a very nice imaging unit, and um, you know this is this is what it's like. Uh, the imaging unit is actually an interventional suite. Uh, it's a hybrid a cath lab, which you don't see here, uh, and I did that purposefully because I'm not an interventionalist and I don't want to be one. But I really want to prevent people from getting into the cath lab, and in order to do that, we have an interventional hybrid cath lab where we do structural interventions. right next to a ct mr suite uh, this is the um, you know mr and ct suite so that you can move a patient from the imaging suite to the interventional lab and we do a lot of interesting work there it's a very collegial environment we work with our structural interventionalists we do a lot of structural heart uh, uh, interventions as well as complex coronary interventions in the lab and this gives us an opportunity to work hand in hand with our interventionalists and it really makes working together a true joy of my life and this is where i spend most of my most of my days so let me start off by saying that you know the same scanner that we use to diagnose coronary artery disease has provided provided us some very um, interesting and fascinating insights into the biology of atherosclerosis and um, can you hear the sound yes sir okay now this is this is actually an egyptian mummy speaking can you believe that and the way they did that was to take a ct scan of a mummy and they used um uh, three dimensional modeling in order to recreate the larynx and they they blew air through the um through the larynx to the artificial larynx um and produced the sound right so it gives you a fascinating insight uh in terms of how um uh, the mummies were configured but more importantly i think ct scans have also given us tremendous information about the biology of atherosclerosis obviously even back during the ancient times nearly 4000 years ago and this is a sum total of a meta analysis of all mummies there were 137 mummies from four regions across the world spanning 4000 years so some of them were from egypt now lesser known is that there were also mummies in peru 
and also in the southwestern United States, so called the Pueblan. These are American Indian uh, mummies, and as well as the Aleutian Islands, which is right off the coast of uh, the United States, uh, straddling Russia and the US. And if you put all these mummies together, what was very, very um, common to all these mummies was that there was atherosclerosis. Roughly 35% of all the mummies across all four geographic regions had atherosclerosis, whether it's in the coronary arteries or whether it's in the odor, iliacs, what was uh, quite common was the presence of calcific atherosclerosis. And this is shown here in this little histogram plot that shows what we know to be very true. As you grow older, and this is a third decade, the fourth decade and the fifth decade, you see a gradual increase in the presence of atherosclerosis. And we now know that the initial um, foundations for atherosclerosis are actually uh, put down even in utero, right? As you're, as you're developing the developing fetus, you know, there's also some evidence to suggest that there's, you know, some amount of intimal um, uh, changes that occur in utero. And certainly during the first decade of one's life, you already have um, atherosclerosis being put down. And by the time you're the fifth decade, almost 90% of patients have atherosclerosis. So now whether you like it or not, as you grow older, atherosclerosis is something that's inevitable for all of us, right? Now, if you take our patients, and this is uh, an interesting common clinical scenario that we, we often find ourselves in. On the right-hand side, you have a 58-year-old patient who's a type two diabetic, and you, these are the metabolic parameters. She's on two oral antihypoglycemic agents, hemoglobin A1C of 7.5, LDL cholesterol of 102, blood pressure 135 over 80. And this is a CT scan showing you some minimal luminal irregularities. There's a stenosis there, and it's obviously a little tight involving the proximal LED. And on the left-hand side is another patient. This patient obviously has severe calcific atherosclerosis involving the LAD and the ramus intermedius. Uh, but you know the metabolic parameters is exactly identical. Now, if I were to tell you, if you met these patients in clinic, you would have absolutely no idea how to separate out this patient from, the, from this patient. And if you're using angiography to do it, you're gonna to be totally wrong, right? Because angiography is actually a very poor tool to diagnose coronary atherosclerosis. And we know this all the time. Um, you know, we know this, we often find, uh, you know, so-called luminal irregularities that don't look angiographically tight, but when you IVIS them or you do a CT angiogram, there's a, it lights up like a Christmas tree, right? This happens every day when I'm in the CT lab, this happens all the time, right? So if CT was invented before we had invasive coronary angiography, I will tell you, you wouldn't be doing invasive coronary angiography today. But you know what we have is invasive coronary angiography unfortunately predated CT coronary angiography. And we are now in an um, unfortunate situation where we have an imperfect test. An invasive coronary angiogram is an imperfect test for coronary atherosclerosis. And we make a lot of decisions based on that. Unfortunate, but true. All right, so this patient on the right side has a 10 year cardiovascular event rate of 5%. And the patient on the left side, identical metabolic parameters, has a cardiovascular mortality rate of 20%, right? Now, it's vitally important that you make the distinction between these two patients, because if you can do that, then you're going to put them on appropriate medications to prevent future cardiovascular events. If you're not able to do that, then it's not going to be very good for your patient, because the patient is going to have cardiovascular events. Unfortunately, in cardiology, and this is a slide taken from my very good friend, Jim Min. I don't know if many of you know who Jim Min is, but Jim Min is a CT angiographer, and he's done a lot of work in this area. And he always likes to put up the slide. He says, in cardiology, we ask the right questions. We really want to know. We are one of the smartest docs, um, I think so at least, um, you know, compared to other specialties. It often attracts very bright minds, such as yourself. It's very competitive to get into cardiology as opposed to other specialties. There are lots of right people and we ask the right questions, but unfortunately we ask the right questions in the wrong order because what we do is we start from here. We stand, this is all the more true in a country like India where the first event for somebody is a myocardial infarction. And when a patient comes in and it's, it, the doctor is not to be held responsible because patients don't want to take medications. It's very hard to convince patients to take medications. They often think they can take medications, stop it. There are a lot of cultural issues. So I won't get into that. But the point is 
that we often start with a wrong order of questions because we start here. What we should be doing is starting here, is diagnosing atherosclerosis and starting preventive therapies when you diagnose atherosclerosis. So, and this, this, this is uh, very important because as cardiologists, we are trained to look for ischemia, but I would argue that perhaps the more important treating the biology or treating atherosclerosis per se and worrying less about ischemia. We spent about, I don't know, four decades now chasing ischemia, right? And we know the results of the trial ischemia where it doesn't really seem to matter, right? Uh, whether or not you cure ischemia. What's really important could be identifying atherosclerosis and putting patients in appropriate treatments. So I'm gonna leave you with four, four concepts before we get into some data from Clarify, which is a very large registry that we started in Cleveland and a very interesting registry with CT coronary calcium scoring, which I think is perhaps underutilized in India and should be utilized more often, right? So let me start with the first concept. The first concept you already know, traditional diagnostic workup identifies only minority at risk individuals. So if you do patients, if you do uh, risk factor approaches, um, or if you use even a stress test, it's gonna miss a lot of patients, right? Minority of patients with coronary artery disease are symptomatic. Most of them are asymptomatic. And the first presentation for a patient is often a myocardial infarction. So you can't use symptoms. You can't use stress testing oftentimes. We do stress testing all the time, but it's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no reason to do that. On the other hand, I would argue that identifying atherosclerosis is perhaps far more important so that you can get patients on the appropriate treatments. The majority of patients with coronary artery disease are asymptomatic rather than being symptomatic. 50 million, this is in the United States, and this is 10 million who are really uh, symptomatic in a population of 340 million patients. The second concept is cardiovascular disease is totally preventable. You know, I've, you know, I've traveled in India for many decades now, and everywhere you go, if you talk to physicians, not lately though, because people, people are smart, and I think physicians are starting to recognize that cardiovascular disease is an, an ultimate analysis, an environmental disease. The genetic underpinnings of cardiovascular disease is minimal, right? As you know, there are very few single gene mutations that cause cardiovascular disease. There are polymorphisms, clearly. There's a lot of polymorphisms that collectively could give you disease, but by and far, Cardiovascular disease, including myocardial infarction, stroke, and peripheral vascular disease is environmental, where 10% of the population attributable risk is genetic, but 90% is environmental. It's a whole bunch of risk factors. It's diet, it's exercise, it's air pollution, it's people you hang out with, it's childhood trauma, it's uh, pesticide exposures, it's the environment or what you're surrounded by that really predisposes you to cardiovascular disease. And if you can make an impact on all of these various factors, you can prevent cardiovascular disease. Certainly true for diabetes, as you know, because diabetes is totally preventable, right? By acting on risk factors. And the name of the game is really starting early. This is very important for the fellows, right? We all know this. If I ask Dr. Monogaran, if I ask Dr. Murali Dharan, if I ask Dr. Bhupati, they'll all say, we know this, stenosis severity, most of myocardial infarction, and this is work from Ambrose who worked at Mount Sinai nearly, I don't know, 30, um, 25 years ago, and um, actually 35 years ago. And then this is Little, Nobuyushi, so Valentin Fuster did some of the work, but majority of events actually happen to occur um, in non-significant coronary lesions. So going after Significant stenosis is a wrong approach. You have to treat the non-significant stenosis. How do you do that? Well, prevention and treating them with statins, treating them with SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonists, et cetera. Now, it's also true that it's not as simple as this because there's also another trial called PROSPECT. And for those of you who have not looked at this, I would encourage you to do this, the trainees. PROSPECT was a natural history study where they actually did IVIS and they used a technique called virtual histology. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, um, an AI sort of deep learning based approach of using IVIS images, Fourier transforming them and coming up with virtual histology so that you can actually diagnose the presence of atheroma, thin cap fibroma with minimal luminal area less than four. And what this slide is showing you is that if you have in this study of about 800 patients, the 
uh, patients who had thin cap fibroatheroma, patients who had a lot of clock burden and thin cap fibroatheroma, and the extreme uh, form where you have TICFA, clock burden, plus minimum luminal area, all three parameters, these patients are a 17 fold higher, right? 17 fold higher. Actually, this is a percent risk, actually, for your, it's not hazard ratio, there's actually a percent event rates. The event rates were highest in these patients, telling you that it's not as simple as, oh, the less than 50% stenosis causes all of the events. Not quite true. It's also true that the, 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 the higher the degree of stenosis, it's likelier that those uh, lesions could also cause events. But importantly, it's a company you keep. So in other words, if you have a 70% lesion, and let's say you have three 70% stenosis, the probability of having 10 less than 50% stenosis is much higher than somebody who doesn't have any significant stenosis, right? So the burden of disease attracts more disease. So the, the more significant stenosis you have, the more non-significant lesions that you're gonna find all over your coronary arteries. And this is what this is trying to tell you, that you can get events not only from non-culprit lesions that are heavily stenotic, that have significant stenosis, but also in plaques that are non-significant in, in origin. So you have, to, you have to watch out for both is the message from Prospect as well as all the other studies. I'm sorry, I think I just quit my sharing screen. I'll go back to it in just a second. Um, can you see my screen again? Yes, sir. Okay, terrific. All right, so moving on, I think the, the important thing with this is the concept, which, which I just mentioned to you of uh, stenosis severity. And the fact of the matter is you can get significant um, 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 events, both from non-significant lesions as well as from significant stenosis. And uh, it's a company that you keep. The more you have uh, significant stenosis, the more likely that you have a lot of disease that can give rise to um, you know, an event. And you know this as interventional cardiologists, when you IVIS uh, a lesion or when you, when you actually do uh, OCT, you find a lot of disease. And that's why we as CT angiographers we find disease all the time. So when I say your CT angiogram was normal, it's very rare for me to actually call a CT angiogram normal because I usually find something or the other. I find a little speck of calcium. I find positive remodeling. I find intimal thickening. I find a lot of changes. And angiographically, you won't find those. You know, if you do a coronary angiogram, uh, to me, it's a pretty, pretty, um, you know, a dramatic uh, difference when you look at a CT angiogram and you look at a, uh, a ang angiogram. And uh, the angiographers will come and say, you know, I didn't see much in the coronary angiogram. It looks pretty normal. I say, of course, you know, of course, I don't expect you to see anything because coronary angi angiography is an inferior test and won't pick up a lot of lesions. All right, enough of that. I think I've, I've, I've made my point. The fourth concept is that biomarkers. And you can use five biomarkers, six biomarkers, or 10 biomarkers. It doesn't make a damn difference. If you put this all together, and this is what we call a C statistics or um, a, a, a test, it's called the area under the curve, where it gives you the probability okay, of an event. On the y axis, you have sensitivity, and on the x axis, you have one minus specificity. So the more the curve moves towards this area, then it's a better test. And you can see. Even if you combine traditional uh, risk stratification using, let's say, an AHA ACC scoring system, which includes age, LDL cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, et cetera, and then you add biomarkers to it, you add troponin, you add CRP, it doesn't really change uh, the, the predictive, um, predictive accuracy of the test. Um, what really does change things is, um, as I'll show you, uh, tests like CT coronary calcium. Uh, uh, CT coronary calcium or even CT angiography that incorporates CT coronary calcium. The fifth concept that I want to leave you with, which is very important from a prevention standpoint, is the exposure over time. And this is, I take a lot of time to talk to my patients about this because they don't understand when they come to see me in clinic, they say, okay, well, your risk, your 10 year risk is, you know, whatever, 15%. Um, and I try to tell them this patient. For 50 years of age, what's that? And I had to tell him, look, if I treat you now, the reason I'm treating you now is so that you can avoid having a stroke or a myocardial infarction when you're 75 years of age, okay? 
And what you're doing is taking a life insurance plan and you're, you're buying a life insurance policy by taking a statin. A statin is like a life insurance policy and you're paying 10 rupees for it every day, right? Because by intervening early, you're reducing atherosclerosis per se and you're changing the biology of the disease. And this slide depicts the biology or so-called um, concept of area uh, over time where you have, this is the asymptomatic phase on the y-axis. This is clinical horizon or plaque rupture. And you can see uh, this is a very acute um, increase into the clinical phase. So let's say you have high LDL cholesterol, you have familial hypercholesterol, you have diabetic, you're hypertensive. You know, your progression from asymptomatic to symptomatic is very fast. On the other hand, when you treat patients, you're now changing the trajectory of the disease, right? And this is what you're doing by treating patients early. Now, how do we know this works? Well, we know this because thanks to um, studies like this, this is a Mendelian randomization study. And I don't know how many of you trainees know what this is, but I would urge you to go back and look at what this um, concept is. Mendelian randomization, to be very succinct, is like a natural clinical trial. So you're randomized at birth to certain types of genetic variants, right? And in this case, it happens to be genetic variants that predispose you to lower LDL cholesterol levels, right? And they could be 50, 60, 70 genetic variants that predispose you to having lower LDL cholesterol. Similarly, there could be genetic polymorphism that predispose you to have, having lower systolic blood pressure. So in this, my good friend, Brian Ferenc, who works at Cambridge, very smart man, who's done, who's made a living out of doing Mendelian randomization studies. What he did was to look at the UK Biobank. The UK Biobank has approximately half a million um, uh, British citizens who gave their blood to have, um, you know, um, their blood genotyped. It has a number of other risk factors together. And what they did, what uh, Brian Ferenc said was, let me take all the genetic data and let's find out patients who had, um, who had polymorphisms that predisposed them to lower blood pressure. So here are the patients who had polymorphisms that predisposed them to lower systolic blood pressure. These patients had roughly, uh, I think it's something like, um, 30 or 40% reduction in cardiovascular events, which is highly significant. Then he took patients who had polymorphisms that lowered their LDL cholesterol, right? They had approximately a 60% reduction in um, cardiovascular events. This is the odds ratio of um, cardiovascular events in the UK biobank. Now, when he took patients who had polymorphisms that had both lower LDL cholesterol and lower systolic blood pressure, so these patients are being exposed to lower LDL cholesterol and lower systolic blood pressure over a lifetime. Because as I mentioned, these are Mendelian randomization. They've been randomized to having polymorphisms or not polymorphisms. But when you have these two together, look at their risk. 90% reduction in cardiovascular events. Or I think the 85% reduction in cardiovascular events. Incredible. So that tells you that if you happen to go on a drug that lowers your systolic blood pressure starting at age 40. Similarly, if you treat your LDL cholesterol starting at age 40, together, let's say you happen to do a natural experiment where you put a patient on an angiotensin receptor blocker and you put them in a statin and you treated them from age 40, your risk, uh, your probability of lowering cardiovascular events, I shouldn't say probability, the, uh, the estimated risk reduction in cardiovascular events over the next you know, 30, 40 years is going to be nearly 80 to 90%, right? So it's just incredible. And this is the power of exposure over time. And this is so important. And you and I know that there's never gonna be a randomized clinical control trial that's gonna treat patients over a lifetime. It's too hard to do. But what you do have is important experiments like Mendelian randomization that tells you how important it is to intervene early. And this is particularly important for the Indian population where it is a mess. You know as well as I do, you live in a, a pandemic of, of uh, uh, you know, a, a type, two di type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease in India is a pandemic of epic proportions. And it's even more important that we have to persuade and talk to our patients about going on medications that can potentially lower their risk over a lifetime. Because you've seen far too many times, I don't have to tell you, young patients are coming to an acute myocardial infarction 
and their whole life is uh, wasted or uh, succumbing to a stroke. It's very, very unfortunate. So, but very important concept here. Okay, so moving on here, and this is what I was trying to tell you. Here's 88% uh, reduction with combined. This is um, you know, approximately 57% reduction, and this is 49% reduction uh, in cardiovascular event rates. So if you were to put all these lessons together and you summarize what we have learned over four decades, I would say the most important thing is a lifetime exposure concept. So you start, um, you, you, Mendelian randomization studies have really taught us this important lesson that cumulative exposure to risk factors is a powerful determinant of cardiovascular events. And this takes us to the fact that we need to take the totality of risk. You target global risk. You don't treat one risk factor at a time. You treat risk factors together. So a hypertensive patient might not have elevated LDL cholesterols of 130, but it's still important to treat their LDL cholesterol, even if their LDL cholesterol is 100, right? So you got, you got to target global risk. You have to treat risk factors simultaneously. Don't treat stenosis. Don't treat angiographic stenosis, but take care of risk in a patient and start early. So these are the four critical lessons for most, for all you interventional cardiologists. All right, now let's move to risk assessment in atherosclerosis and what's, what's changed over the last several years. This is ATP3 in 2001, so it's nearly 20 years ago, right? Very simplistic. None of this was uh, data-driven, but basically it says estimate your 10-year Framingham risk score. You punch in your numbers in a uh, uh, calculator, take your total cholesterol, your age. Age is a very powerful determinant. Uh, you type in your... Um, presence of diabetes, whether or not you're taking blood pressure medications, cholesterol medicines, and you, it spits out a risk factor. And this is the approach that we took. Since then, I think there's been uh, a lot of different modifications of the uh, risk assessment approach uh, to help guide decision-making in primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And in a sense, I would say this is from the ACCAHA guidance document um, and, you know, you are busy practitioners and, and busy practitioners don't sit down and calculate 10-year cardiovascular risk. Unfortunate, but true. It's just too busy. You'll have to ask your nurse to do it or somebody else. Or sometimes it's just looking at the patient, right? Uh, and you can get a sense, but it's often encouraged for you to calculate your risk score and put that into your note because it really helps the patient. It helps the provider understand what their risk is. So the approach can be simplified into three, three steps. One is calculate, second is personalize, and third is reclassify. Calculate, personalize, reclassify, CPR, right? So what does personalization mean? Personalization means this particular approach might not be appropriate for many patients, particularly those who happen to be in the intermediate 10-year risk score range. So in other words, 7.5 to 7, 20% or 5 to 7.5%. And in these cases, before you put a patient on a medication like a statin, it might, uh, it might be um, preferable for you to have a better understanding of the person's individual risk. And in order to ascertain individual risk, there's no better test than doing a coronary artery calcium score. So I know in India it's available, you can do it. You don't have to do a CT angiogram, you can just do a coronary calcium for most patients. It's uh, affordable. Um, you know, I don't know how much this may be in the discussion, we can talk about it. But really, it's a very, very simple test, gives you a lot of information. And then once you do your calcium score information, you can then further personalize approaches. Um, and, um, and then, you know, truly um, design a therapy for your patient. So we are witnessing a shift, at least in uh, the West. I think we are really shifting from a risk-based approach to benefit-based approaches, where uh, we are trying to enhance targeting, targeting of therapy. Because... Um, there are many expensive therapies available now, particularly for diabetes or GLP-1 receptor agonists or SDLT2 inhibitors. How do you target, how do you use them in patients, right? You, you need to really understand um, uh, the risk of the patient and truly understand if the patient is going to benefit from that approach. So personalization is very, very important. And I do believe that cal coronary calcium score allows you to do that. Now, the problem with calculators is there are too many of them, right? Um, there's roughly more than 100 calculators across the world. If you go to the United Kingdom, they'll say you do a QRIS score. If you go to Germany, they'll say ProCam. If you go to the United States, they'll say cardiovascular risk calculator. Then you have the European approach. In Germany, they use uh, score. So it becomes very, very confusing very quickly. And there has to be 
somehow it needs to be much simpler to uh, a clinician. So in this regard, I think what I'm about to share with you over the next several slides is how simple an approach is uh, coronary calcium uh, scoring. And to the best of my knowledge, I think the prognostic power of coronary artery calcium is just superlative, so much so that there have been literally tens of, um, I don't know, 40, 50 studies. Many of them are prospective cohort studies. Some of them have been retrospective analysis, but all of them are very consistent in demonstrating that coronary calcium scoring is superior to and significantly adds to the C statistic. In other words, it's superior to most other traditional approaches to risk stratify patients. And uh, I don't think there's any uh, debate in this. Most people are, agree that this is indeed true. The other value of doing a coronary artery calcium score is the value or the power of zero, right? So what is the value of power of zero? Now, zero is invented in India, as you know, but zero also happens to be a very powerful metric for coronary artery calcium scores. If you have a score of zero, if the patient doesn't have any other risk factors, including diabetes, then the warranty period, in other words, the duration during which the patient can safely be assumed of not having an event is almost 15 years. That's a pretty darn good uh, period during which you can reassure your patient and say, listen, your score was zero. It's a very small likelihood that you're gonna have an event over the next 15 years. And it's still possible they might die, obviously. Uh, there's, no, um, you know, there's no limiting um, the stochastic nature of risk in that sense, but you can minimize the probability of the event for most patients. If you're a diabetic, I would say the uh, warranty period is roughly five years for a diabetic. A coronary artery calcium score of zero is associated with a vascular age of 10, 20, and 30 years lower than the chronological age. So if you're 60 you're, and your coronary artery calcium score is zero, then your true age, your physiological age is 50, right? So it's incredible. Um, uh, so. This, this tells you, um, you know, the value of it. And this actually turns out to be a very good way of communicating risk to a patient. If you tell them, listen, you might be 60, but you're actually behaving like a 40 year old. Patients get that, they really understand that. So the concept of vascular age is a good one to communicate risk to patients, right? Now, coronary artery calcium score, many studies have shown this is a strongest predictor of death and reclassified uh, much beyond most of the other risk calculators, right? So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of walk you through this a little bit um, tricky, but basically what this says is, if you have a calcium score of zero, this helps you reclassify risk. So in other words, if your risk calculator says that your risk is 5 to 7.5%, but when you do a calcium score and the calcium score is zero, a lot of these patients might have a calcium score of zero. So, and this happens in this particular uh, paper published from MESA, which is a very large cohort of roughly 5,500 patients. Kuram Nasir, uh, the first author in this, showed that 57% of patients who, were, who you thought had a risk of 5 to 7.5% actually had a calcium score of zero. That puts them at very low risk. So you can, you can prevent putting them or placing them on a statin. Right? That's incredible, 57% of patients, that's a big number. Similarly, if you take patients with a 10-year risk of 7.5 to 20%, roughly 45% of them had calcium score of zero. Right? This really shifts, reclassifies the patient. So in India, if you're trying to decide on treatments, you're trying to convince patients, it's actually a very good test to do. And you don't have to deal with a CT angiogram. Um, you, know, you can just do a coronary calcium score and that's good enough uh, for most patients. And even in hypertensives, it's very good. So let's say you have a patient who comes in with hypertension, LDL cholesterols of 95, and you're going, should I treat the patient with statins or not? Because again, it's not about the absolute value of LDL cholesterol. It's about global risk, right? So even if you're a hypertensive patient, they might benefit from a statin. The question, am I going to put a patient with an LDL cholesterol of 95 on a statin? Well, I'd like to find out. You do a coronary artery calcium score, the calcium score is high, or it's at least greater than 100, or even greater than zero. For me, any presence of atherosclerosis on a coronary artery calcium score is a trigger to treat them aggressively. So I put them in an antihypertensive. I also treat them with a statin, right? So this makes a lot of sense. So it helps you stratify risk even in hypertension. You can stratify in diabetics also. 
can satisfy patients with pre-diabetics, right? If you have a hemoglobin A1C of 5.9, most Indians are pre-diabetic, unfortunately, about the age of 50, and you're trying to figure out, am I going to treat this patient or not? Unfortunately for pre-diabetes, we wait 10 years before you do anything. They go see a cardiologist. Cardiologist says, it's fine. I'm not going to treat your pre-diabetes. I'm not going to you know, put you on medications. But this pre-diabetic might be at risk for future events. How are you going to find out? Calcium scoring can help you pre stratify patients at risk. So here's uh, some data from diabetes, as you can see here. Um, and this is where the number of five years came, came in. In this particular study, if you have a calcium score of zero, then at least for five years, you don't have events. After five years, you started seeing a slightly higher risk in patients who are diabetics, right? Obviously, if you have calcium scores greater than 400, very, very high risk. All right. Now, we do have evidence that, at least from Scott Hart, this is from um, David Newby, a good friend who works in Edinburgh. David, um, you know, um, put, put together a very exciting trial to show the utility of CT coronary angiography in, in, um, in Scotland, uh, where he's from. And in this study, what he showed was he randomized patients to a CT angiography approach versus a traditional approach. And you might read the paper for this, but the bottom line, is what he showed was physicians changed their behaviors. When you showed them a CT coronary angiogram that showed that there was a stenosis, they did something, right? They put the patient on statins. They you know, put, them, put them on preventive medications, et cetera. And they changed the biology of disease so much so there was a 41% reduction in death. I've asked David Newby this question. How do you know that this is you would have gotten the same results if you'd done coronary artery calcium scores because once you send a report to a physician that says, and I put in my reports, even if there's a calcif if there's calcification in the coronary arteries, my first line in the report is coronary atherosclerosis. Because the moment I say that, my referring cardiologist is going to put the patient in a stat. So I've already done my job by communicating risk to a patient. So physicians modify their behavior when they do it. And this is what happened in Scott Hart. Now, Scott Hart was not a trial of coronary calcium scoring. It was a trial of CT angiography, but it has the same impact. Once you tell a physician that you have a stenosis or you have luminal irregularities, or if you have you know, coronary artery calcium, they change, their, uh, they change their approaches, therapeutic approaches, and thereby they have the potential to change the biology of disease. So now, the problem with calcium scores is, at least in the US, it's not reimbursed widely, you know, and uh, this, is, this has been a problem. This is a, this is a best test available for mankind for atherosclerosis, and it's not reimbursed. It doesn't make a lot of sense, and I can't fully explain it. Uh, there are a lot of you know, reasons why, which we can discuss if you have time, but the bottom line is it's not widely reimbursed, despite the fact that it's one of the best tests. Um, it's, it's cheap though. Most institutions you know, uh, in the US, you can get it for roughly 50 to $100, but there's no reason why this shouldn't be done. And one of the reasons for this is we don't have data. People say, oh, you don't have data. Have you shown me a clinical trial that has used coronary artery calcium score uh, and you've changed outcomes? Show me that and then I'll change my practice. But I would submit to you that that's completely hocus pocus, right? I would say that the Framingham risk score or the um, the ACCA chair risk calculator also doesn't have a randomized controlled clinical trial. So why are you recommending that you use that, but not coronary artery calcium score? So it's a double standard. Now, this is a very important paragraph that I'll read to you from Harvey Hecht, who was a, a very thoughtful writer and has done a lot of work on coronary artery calcium score. And here's what he said. He said, randomized controlled trials are not necessary to prove that treatment of high-risk patients saves lives. If a randomized controlled clinical trial, so in other words, he's saying, you don't need a randomized controlled clinical trial with coronary artery calcium score to show that it saves lives. Because if you did a trial <clears throat> with coronary artery calcium score and that trial failed to show that treatment of CAC or coronary artery calcium identified high-risk patients saved more lives, the fault would lie with the treatment rather than the test. Why are you blaming the test? You know, it's kind of a ridiculous thing to say, you know, you have to show me a randomized clinical control 
of course, the coronary artery calcium scoring when you know that it's a very good risk predictor, right? So, you know, um, so this is another reason why I think this is a, a double standard. But nevertheless, there is such a trial being performed in the Netherlands. It's called Robinska. And this will be reported out probably in 2022. This is a nationwide study where patients are being randomized to coronary artery calcium score screening or um, classical risk factor, risk factor-based approach. And they will look at event rates. And hopefully Robinska will show uh, you know, that uh, a screening approach with coronary artery calcium score is superior to, um, to a risk factor-based approach. Now, I'm very excited to work at an institution where we've done some very incredible things, right? And one of the things that we've done is to eliminate um, the charge for coronary artery calcium score. So if you came to uh, university hospitals in Cleveland, you can have a calcium score for free. We don't charge you for it, which is incredible, right? And we have we have established a huge database. We've done over 50,000 calcium scores. So if you came to uh, Cleveland, you can have a calcium score for free. And this is one of the largest programs. It is the largest program in the world where we read roughly 13,000 scans every year. And this is an incredible uh, natural experiment that's happening. So this is how we started. We started back in 2015 by doing a pilot. So this is the number of coronary artery calcium scores per month. And this is the, uh, um, the month and year, as you can see here. Now, this is when we started offering it for free, right? So this is uh, January of 2017. I look at the volumes every month. So we do roughly 800 to 900 scans every, every month and roughly about 14,000 scans, <clears throat> excuse me, every year. Our, our registry is called Clarify. Uh, the first paper came out in Jack, I'll share with you, uh, you know, some of the results. But what it showed was, and this is like, this is the blue is when we charged $50 for it. And this is no charge. The red is when we charging, um, we, we're charging, we're not charging um, anything for $0, actually $99 and then $0. And here's what it showed, right? This is, I'll walk you through this. So here is the percentage of patients um, within each um, pooled code equation. So we divided patients into three categories, less than 5% risk, 5 to 7.5% and greater than 7.5%. Now, if you take patients who are supposed to be less than 5% risk using the ACC AHA risk calculator, you'll find that roughly 8% of them are very high risk, defined as scores of greater than 100. You see that? So your ACC AHA calculator is incorrect in identifying patients who might be a truly high risk. On the other hand, if you take so-called high risk patients or intermediate risk patients greater than 7.5%, you see that roughly 27% of them had zero coronary calcium scores. And these are patients that you would not put on a statin, right? Okay, can you hear me? I think I hear some background noise. Everybody everybody with me, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, great. So yeah, this, yeah. Tells you, this tells you that you misclassify patients quite a bit when you use traditional risk factor approaches. And this is the reason why, at least at uh, University Hospital, we say, forget about risk factor approaches. If you have one or more risk factors and you're more than 45 as a male and greater than 55 as a female, just do a calcium score. That's it, for free. Based on that, you can personalize risk management for patients. And this is what we find. This is actually, this is uh, published recently in Jack, but there are several other papers coming out where we show that calcium scoring, the moment you show the score to a physician or you even show that to a patient, they change their behaviors. They, they get frightened. You can frighten a patient, especially if you show them a nice um, uh, figure or you show them a nice cartoon with calcium scores within their arteries. You show them a heart and you show them, look, you're gonna die from this. Right? You frighten your patients and they change their behavior. They start walking. All of a sudden, they'll go to the beach and they'll start walking. They'll reduce their carbohydrate consumption. They'll start eating healthy. They, they start, uh, and they start lowering their cholesterol. Right? So this, this shows you the probably the Kaplan-Meier curves showing you that as your calcium score gets higher, then there's much more likely to be on a statin prescription. Right? And 
change in LDL cholesterol. So physicians and patients changed their behaviors once they got a calcium score report, which is very good. Not only that, they also changed their behaviors. Blood pressures got better. Weight loss actually got slightly better. Triglycerides decreased much more in high calcium score patients. So we were able to see a number of changes in parameters of metabolic health after a coronary artery calcium assessment. Now, one of the big questions is, if you do a calcium score, does that change invasive coronary angiography? Maybe you're cathing patients more often, right? Well, it turns out that most of the patients who are having invasive coronary angiography were often patients who had very high calcium scores, greater than 400, who also were having atypical symptoms, and they generally needed to have a diagnostic coronary angiogram. So although there was a trend towards a higher rate of non-invasive stress testing in patients, I would argue that this is probably necessary because you're, you're trying to identify uh, you know, significant stenosis or ischemia. And there's still a debate now with regards to whether we should act on ischemia versus uh, act on atherosclerosis. And as long as we continue to be reimbursed for things like stress testing, the physicians will continue doing those types of things. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think we might, there's still some work to be done in this area. But I'm showing you the data where calcium scoring does result in an increase in non-invasive stress testing. But I would argue that this is probably money well spent to prevent future cardiovascular events. So I'm not gonna, you know, I could share, share with you more slides, but where are we going with this? Well, where are we going with this is, I think calcium scoring now is at a phase where we're now going to calcium scoring 2.0, the second version, where it's becoming, it has a potential to become a new digital care pathway to prevent heart attacks, where by integrating not only your calcium scoring information, but also genomic information, your risk factor information, your environmental information, and by using artificial intelligence and deep learning approaches, this is where the field is going. There are lots of companies, including the Amazons and the Googles of the world that are working on personalized medicine approaches. And as you know, there are lots of genomics companies now in the US working on things like this, where they're taking data, putting it all together and personalizing approaches for patients. And this is where the work is gonna be in the future, in the, future, in the next 10 years at least, where there's gonna be a lot of companies pushing digital care pathways uh, to prevent uh, cardiovascular events. And this is some work that we are doing using things like machine learning. You know that there's a lot of um, data suggesting that if you quantify adipose tissue, so this is pericardial fat here, and there is a visceral fat, um, you can use all of these information from a CT scan using machine learning approaches to identify novel risk factors. And you can put this together with calcium scoring to come up with better risk estimators uh, in patients. And using artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches, you can use what's called radiomics. Uh, and this is becoming very, very uh, common because there are lots of uh, big data companies that are utilizing information like this in order to further refine risk models. Here is another, uh, this is work from our group looking at um, hepatic steatosis. Prediabetes and diabetes is a very important risk predictor for future cardiovascular events. Hepatic fat is a wonderful predictor for future diabetes occurrence. So one area of interest would be to take pre-diabetics. And one of the problems with pre-diabetes is you don't know who's gonna become a diabetic. There are many pre-diabetics who might never become a diabetic, um, but there are some that might become a diabetic within the next one year. Turns out that the presence of hepatic fat is a very important predictor for future development of diabetes. And you can use CT in order to quantify hepatic fat. So you can, you can do all of this with one scan. You just do one scan, you can derive liver fat, you can derive visceral fat, you can derive pericardial fat, you can derive coronary calcium score, you can put this all together into a model, use machine learning to come up with, and you can do this very, very easily because any engineering student worth the salt can do this um, you know, in 24 hours. So these kinds of approaches are gonna become very common uh, in the next, uh, actually it's happening right now. So this is uh, another way of using calcium scoring information rather than using Agatston scores. You can use texture, um, the, um, the, uh, the distribution, the three-dimensional um, um, uh, distribution of coronary artery calcium and various other features in order to extract much more information. 
Unfortunately, the Agatston score is a very imperfect way of calcium scoring, but this next generation of machine learning approaches can really give us even richer ways of quantifying risk in patients. And obviously there are lots of opportunity. This is an example of a CT fractional flow reserve. We do this routinely at a hospital where our interventional cardiologists love CT, uh, CT FFR values because they don't, they don't like um, a CT angiogram alone. They actually have gotten very used to doing a CT FFR in our patients. Here's a with a very with very abnormal FFR values along the diagonal and the uh, and the uh, um, approximate LAD, but you can combine CTFR lesions with OCT or with um, uh, traditional CT angiography in order to come up with um, uh, new algorithms. So I'll stop there, but thank you again for this opportunity for sharing some interesting uh, information with you. And I still think we have about you know, five or 10 minutes to, to have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful lecture. Uh, we, uh, we learned a lot. Uh, Dr. Murlidharan sir is here. Uh, Murlidharan sir, would you like to take over? Hello? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Hi, 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 Sanjay. Nice Good to, to see you. See you? Yes. <laughs> Same. Where, where are you traveling? Are you traveling somewhere? Yeah, I had to come oh, on an unavoidable. Some cropped up. I had to be in just land an airport uh, oh, wow. in Kerala. So, so okay. but I, I could catch up your talk from the eighth minute of it. Wonderful, okay. wonderful talk and great work, great work being done. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, in fact, I have nothing to come and begin a lot. We can discuss a lot on and on. But as you rightly point out, we in this country landed up in this mess. One is the stress for this type of important learning, the basics and prevention is given less importance. Other extreme is like uh, that means the benefits of prevention is uh, not told properly among the medical community to the patient. Other extreme is uh, for interventional thing, the harm of the procedure also not being explained to the patient. So yes. both the uh, uh, medical group and even the company, the, even the doctors are uh, at, uh, at distress because of this. We are, we are not stressing benefits and we are not stressing harm. But beautiful talk, beautifully elucidated. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, no, it's a pleasure. It's a there pleasure. are a lot it's of a other senior uh, cardiologists, including Dr. K. Abraham, sir, Dr. Murugesan, sir, and one, one of my mentors, Dr. Rajiv Agarwal, is here. I would request uh, them uh, to ask uh, any questions to uh, Dr. Sanjay Rajagopalan, sir. Can I come in, Bhumpati? Yeah, yes, sir. Good evening, Dr. Sanjay. It was a pleasure listening to you. It can't be simpler than this. It can't be more provocative than this. Uh, my question is, as you know, statin increased calcium score. I want to learn from you, what is the status of doing repeat CT calcium scoring following uh, statin usage? There is a recent understanding that the pattern of calcification is different following a statin use vis-a-vis -a, -vis a natural progression of atherosclerosis. So I, I want to learn from you. Yeah. So well, thank you, Rajiv. Great question. You know, really, for most patients, there's no need to do repeat coronary calcium scoring. Now, there are situations where um, a calcium score might be warranted, uh, where you might want to repeat it, typically in situations where the patient's clinical circumstances change. For instance, you know, let's say you have a patient who um, all of a sudden developed um, an inflammatory disorder that predisposes him to future cardiovascular disease, let's say ankylosing spondylitis, or I don't know, um, Crohn's disease or IBD or some other rheumatoid arthritis that increases the risk for future cardiovascular disease, you might want to revisit uh, the calcium score in roughly five years. You know, they're typically what the recommendations say. Or you could have a patient who's now a diabetic, wasn't a diabetic before, but is now a diabetic. Therefore, it's metabolic changes, uh, metabolic parameters have changed. So that might be a reason to repeat one. Calcium scores, you know, there have been a number of studies done in the 1990s and early 2000s that looked at progression of 
kidneys. And kidneys don't change, um, you know, calcification. They don't change the progression of, uh, you know, uh, calcification. Or in other words, it doesn't decrease at least, right? It, it, it might have a, it might have a uh, benefit in terms of future progression rates of calcification, but the calcium score itself, you know, sort of plateaus and remains the same. So, but uh, as, a, as a monitor of therapy, it's not recommended. In other words, if you're doing it just to see whether statins are working, it's probably not a good idea. But in general, the guidelines say that you would consider repeating a calcium score in, in, the, in an individual where the clinical um, parameters or, um, you know, um, clinical circumstances change. So it's more or less one-time test. That's right. That's right. That's right. But in certain situations, you know, it's, it's not uncommon at all where, you know, you did a calcium score five years ago and now the patient comes to you is already, or he's, he's taking insulin now or whatever. He's taking, you know, anti-diabetic agents and you want to know whether things have changed, right? Uh, his calcium score was zero five years ago. Now he's a diabetic and you really want to know whether, you know, uh, a situation has changed. Now you could say, does it really matter? Because in my practice, once a patient is a diabetic, I'm doing everything possible, you know, in order to lower their risk. So I have them on, I have them on an SGLT2 inhibitor. I'm treating them already with a GLP-1 agonist. I have them on a statin. I'm doing all of those things, right? So it might not be necessary, you know, because ultimately you do a test if it's going to help you change your management. If you're already doing everything, there's no need to do it. So that's what I would say. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, uh, Dr. Raja Gopal, sir, I have got, I have got a few questions to you. Uh, sure. I have noted those questions. Let me go here. Yeah. So number one, my first question is, uh, your uh, clarify study is quite interesting. Uh, just for my uh, idea, uh, how are you able, uh, in a capitalistic country like United States, how are you able to do this uh, calcium scoring free of cost? That's an interesting question. So, you know, we have, we have a large health system. So our health system is roughly 30 hospitals. We have about uh, actually 18 hospitals and uh, roughly um, 13 regional medical centers. So we have about 20 CT scanners all across our uh, city. So when a patient, you know, CT scanners are a fixed cost. So once you pay for a CT scanner, you have it. Whether you use it or not is your problem, right? So let's say you have a scanner that's not being utilized between 12 and one. Uh, we, we put a CT coronary calcium score in that unfilled slot and try to utilize the scanners more efficiently. That's how we do it. Okay. In a country like India, it might be a little bit more challenging, but I would say you don't have to make it no cost. You make it low cost. You know, you, you charge, uh, uh, it's absolutely reasonable. And I think if you, if you talk to your radiologist, I'm sure you can subsidize the cost of coronary artery calcium score so that it's available for your patients for, I don't know, 200 bucks or 250. How much does an echo cost in India? And on average, it's cost something around 2,000 Indian currencies. You can 2,000 rupees for an echo? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, well, you might want to price it in such a way that it's you know affordable to patients because ultimately, once you, once you do the coronary artery calcium scoring results, oftentimes we find that some of these patients often require additional testing too, right? They often wind up, they might need an echo, they might need a stress test. So some of the downstream procedures also happens to pay for the coronary artery calcium score. That's our experience. But we do have to pay some money, uh, but it doesn't cost us very much. So our program actually is pretty well run and it doesn't cost us a lot of money to support it. Uh, Bhupati, in my system. city, in my city, it costs around three thousand rupees for a coronary artery calcium score, and we are using it a lot. We are using it a lot, and uh, I agree with you that the health behavior changes not only on the part of a patient, but on the part of treating doctor also. They, yes. they suddenly, they both the people they suddenly get empowered for achieving those aggressive targets, what you show in Mendelian randomization. Otherwise, uh, a so-called healthy patient is very, very difficult to ask him, quit smoking, lose weight. And uh, the moment you show, you show the calcium score, the wife pounces upon him and, and what he said, <laughs> frightened. And uh, it works very well. And in long term, it is a good, good job done. I like I like the I like the wife jumping on the husband very much. That's a good one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the that's the way. 
No, That's there has to be behavior. yeah. There has to be somebody to, to monitor at home. There has to be somebody to monitor at home, and wife is the most important person in changing the health behavior in kitchen right. and as well as physical activities. One hundred percent agree. Doctor uh, Sanjay, sir, one more, a few more questions from my side. Uh, in your clarify study published in JAC, uh, you told that uh, this uh, ACT risk score less than five percent, eight percent turned out to be statin needed, guys. Uh, it's for entire subset of patients. Do we have any subset analysis for South Asian population? ACT score, I feel, it's underestimates the risk in uh, South Asian population. Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah, that's that's actually well known. So one of the things that we do. In our program, is if you're South Asian, uh, South Asian ancestry is an atherosclerosis risk enhancer. So if you happen to be South Asian, and if you happen to be 40 years of age, in other words, less than a cutoff for our program is greater than 45 if you're a male. If you're a South Asian male and you're less than 45, you can get a free coronary artery calcium score because you recognize that uh, traditional risk scoring algorithms are not very good at identifying risk in South Asians. Absolutely right. Okay. Uh, in pay, for example, you, 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 you see a patient, uh, 47 year old, non-diabetic, no other risk factors, no other risk factors uh, coming for routine. Uh, uh, he's feared about having a CAD. Uh, he's not specific pains. You, you did a uh, for calcium scoring, you got a calcium score of uh, 250. And there's no obstructive lesions there. It's completely asymptomatic, no other family history. What is the target? You, you, did, a, you, did, a, you did a CT angiogram or a coronary no, no, calcium no. score? Calcium scoring alone. Sorry, uh, you can. You did a, cal a CT angiography. Uh, calcium score was given along with that. There's no obstructive lesion. Uh, calcium score of something around 150 to 170, 150 to 200. It's not more than 400. It's clearly right. not significant lesion. It doesn't warrant an invasive angiography. Uh, would you target an LDL of less than 70 in this particular individual, or what is the target you will try to achieve in patients who are high asymptomatic, who are asymptomatic but found to have a, a calcium score of uh, more than 100, but not significant stenosis in CT angiography? Oh, are they diabetic or pre-diabetic? Non-diabetic. Is not not a pre-diabetic or not a diabetic? Do they no, have metabolic? Did they have visceral adiposity? Uh, no, no other risk factors, including metabolic syndrome. See, this is this is one thing. I, I treat them very aggressively. So if they have coronary atherosclerosis, to me, whether it's obstructive, non-obstructive, doesn't make a bit of a difference. They have calcium scores of greater than 100. I try to aim for LDL cholesterols of less than 70, preferably less than 50. I aim for calcium. I aim for systolic blood pressures less than 130. I really look very carefully for pre-diabetes and metabolic syndrome. It's oftentimes missed, particularly in South Asians. So I normally, if you're South Asian and you see me in clinic, I'm very careful about measuring your visceral adiposity. I try to measure your, um, obviously look at your non hdl cholesterol. I do a hemoglobin A1C, even consider a two hour postprandial glucose tolerance test. I can't tell you how many times I find, you know, um, uh, two hour GTTs that are abnormal with hemoglobin A1Cs of 5.9. So I don't take anything for granted. I, I really look very carefully. I also measure, if they have family history of coronary artery disease, I also measure an LP little a, very common. South Asians oftentimes have a higher uh, prevalence of LP little a. So I measure all of those things. And I find reasons to normalize their metabolic profile wherever I can, because I seldom find people South Asians in my practice, and again, you know, North America, they're obviously different than what you see here, a little bit maybe, but many of them are metabolically um, uh, not, not correct. They're metabolically not wired correctly. So I try to find opportunities to optimize their metabolism wherever possible. So yeah, I treat them aggressively. I don't, I don't um, pull out any stops. So obviously at the discussion with the patient, the patient might not be willing and they might say, well, you know, you know, I don't want to go on this treatment and I work with them slowly. You know, I, I, I don't force things on them. I take one step at a time and say, okay, let's work on your cholesterol first. Uh, you know, talk about that first, then come back and then we talk about blood pressure. So it takes a little bit of time, but we get there eventually. Okay. And how commonly you see a patient who's non-diabetic? I know the incidence of diabetes because of statins are very meager. 
maybe the reported incident something around uh, 12 patients out of 1500 patients may develop may become a diabetic after st has having high dose statin but we can save more than hundreds of uh, cad events over a period of 5 to 8 years so how many uh, kind of how many kind of uh, how many percent of patient you you see in your practice who turn out to be diabetic after having high dose of statins uh i would also like to listen from the other uh, senior cardiologist here in anshit i have seen quite yeah. quite a few number of patients after starting rosuva statin especially who have been pre diabetic they turn become fully full blown diabetic or who have been non diabetic and non pre diabetic becoming a diabetic so i discover some of our senior consultants too they have also seen it whether are we under reporting this phenomenon uh I, that is the real concern of mine i i do aggressively to get the ldl down to less than 70 uh but i change i swap door from uh, rosuvastatin to atorvastatin he uh if the individual is going to be a non diabetic or a non pre di kind of a non pre diabetic because most of my experience was initially with rosuvastatin uh, the culprit was rosuvastatin where i found them to be diabetic i hope i got you got what i'm trying to say so Well, I think I'll answer your question. There are a number of questions. Number one is what is the likelihood of the diabetes developing in, in statins? It, uh, now, the studies vary. Uh, some studies, it's uh, as much as one in 1,250 patients. Some are one in 400. But what we know for sure is that the, 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 relative prob the, the probability of developing diabetes in a statin is absolutely related to the metabolic uh, syndrome and metabolic risk factors. right so if you're a patient who has hypertriglyceridemia or your high levels of triglycerides you're viscerally adipose and most of our patients unfortunately belong to that category in 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 india and particularly in chennai everybody that's walking around above the age of 50 has a has a paunch uh everybody's got metabolic syndrome so yeah your risk of developing diabetes and a statin is much higher than if you didn't have those factors so rather than saying and I, it's all how you communicate with your patient where this is why i think the discussion about figuring out whether your patient has metabolic syndrome and pre-diabetes is so important right from the beginning and looking for it okay so that i don't blame the statin and i try to make make it very obvious to the patient that the patient is metabolically dysfunctional when they came to see me in clinic right and most of them have it you know whether you like it or not the vast majority of south asians that i treat have metabolic syndrome they may not meet all the criteria but a lot of them have it So I make this very clear to the patient right when they when I start having a discussion with them because I'm telling them listen your metabolic is not wired correctly because look you got your waist to ratio that's high your triglycerides are 155 but it's not quite normal okay your hemoglobin a1c is 5.7 not quite normal and I only prepare them for it and then I tell them listen now we're going to work on your metabolism together statins might increase the risk but i don't make that a big you know uh, discussion item more importantly i try to figure out ways in which we can target the metabolic risk and work with them to to attenuate that risk so in some patients it does involve working on their obesity and i know it's in india it's tough right because you already have patients that don't want to take medications but i can tell you there are lots of patients who have, whom have started on uh, a GLP-1 on the reglutide for instance because their BMI is greater than 30 right um, or I start them on uh, a weight loss medication in order to optimize their metabolic parameters and when I do that I know that I'm automatically reducing the risk for future development of diabetes with the statin as far as relative risk of diabetes with rosuva versus atorva I'm not aware of any such data uh, you know I think it's all the same a high intensity statin is obviously uh, poses a higher risk in a patient who has multiple uh, uh, risk factors and i will um, you know the the study where this came from is from a, a trial called jupiter many many years ago in jupiter they looked at uh, the number of risk factors that the patient for metabolic risk factors and it turns out that the uh, the the likelihood of developing diabetes was totally related to the number of metabolic risk factors that the patient had so That's what I would say. Does that does that make sense, Nagendra? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yes, doctor. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. And looking at the commentaries of Jupiter, I I recall what you said. I can just crystallize those words. 
that statins prepones diabetes and metabolic syndrome. It does not cause diabetes. That is what I understand. Yeah, that certainly accelerates it. Yeah, and without the absence of those risk factors, the, the likelihood of diabetes occurring is very small. Very small. Okay, uh, terrific. Um, are there any other questions? I think we have arrived at the hour. It's uh, actually beyond the hour. It's uh, 9 11. Yeah, hello? Yeah. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Question. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yes, audible. I can hear you. Yeah. My yes. question is, see, we do see calcium in many patients who, who undergo angiogram. Sometimes they may not have coronary artery obstructive disease, but coronary artery calcification. Do we have any data what should be their calcium score? So I take them for an angiogram. I see a normal, I mean, non-obstructive CAD, just a calcification. What would be the probable calcium score had I done a CT on the same person? Well, you don't know. I think the, uh, the problem with diagnostic coronary angiography is, you know, um, I think you, 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 um, you're not able to make an accurate assessment, right? I mean, you see some haziness, you think there's some calcium, but it's not very accurate. So I'm not sure, you know, whether you can, uh, with any degree of certainty, say what the level of calcification is, or, or you could hypothesize or you could predict what the coronary artery calcium score would be, uh, would be if that's, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not, it cannot be accurately done, right? But there are some interesting technologies, you know, you might've heard of dual energy CTs. There is an X-ray called dual energy X-rays. And there are companies working on dual energy X-rays. So you can get a chest radiograph and in India particularly, it might be very attractive because it's a cheap technology. So rather than using, um, uh, a CT um, um, a CT scanner, you can use a chest X-ray using a dual energy X-ray beam in order to figure out calcium versus no calcium. And you can actually see it very well. Now, um, there are some companies working on it. It might be possible that, uh, you know, such a technology might be valuable in India. But then again, CT technologies are also becoming very, very cheap, very right? Um, uh, becoming very cheap. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, I personally think um, CT coronary calcium scoring should be a routine screening strategy. That's where the field's going now. And uh, hopefully we've contributed to the idea or understanding that, you know, a better way to approach and personalize management of CAD is to just perform a one-time coronary artery calcium score and be done with it. And that can guide you for a very long time. Um, and um, I think the future is going to see, just like you get a mammogram or you get a colonoscopy, you would get a CT coronary calcium score. And perhaps it's, I would argue, far more important than even some of the cancer screening tools that we do, because the probability of having an event or cardiovascular event is much higher than having a cancer, folks. I hope none of you are oncologists listening into the lecture, but uh, I would say that, uh, you, know, um, you know, given the probability, uh, you know, governments and other organizations should uh, make it possible for you to get a screening, um, you know, a test. To, uh, to assess your risk for future cardiovascular events. And I hope that's going to happen in the next decade. <clears throat> At least the guidelines should change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Very good. Hey, listen, it's, it's great uh, spending time with you. And uh, thank you again. To those are wonderful questions and really appreciate the opportunity of uh, sharing some of our data and, uh, you know, spending some time together. Thanks again, uh, Murali, for the invitation, and Nagendra for moderating, Dr. Agarwal, and um, you know, Dr. Manogaran. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. thank you, thank you Sanjay. You. It was a real academic piece. We really thank you it. very much. We'd like to see you, Amit sir, uh, frequently in the coming years. It will be our okay. our pleasure. Okay. Have you as a faculty with us? It's a pleasure.